Hello and welcome to COGEX. This is the research stage held in partnership with the Alan Turing Institute. And we're coming to you live from my aunt's attic. If you'd like to um, tweet, you can do so to the hashtags Turing COGEX or to COGEX 2020. The first session this morning is on collaborative robotics and autonomous systems. It's moderated by one of the Turing's program directors Setu Vijay Kumar. So over to you, Setu. Thank you, Will, um, and a very warm welcome to all of you listening uh, to this virtual COGEX. And uh, indeed, uh, I am excited to bring to you a, a set of really excellent speakers today morning talking about collaborative robotics and autonomous systems. So um, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, tell you how excited I am to be talking about this very um, exciting new uh, area of research, uh, especially in the context of trying to work uh, between sort of robots and humans working together in a situation that uh, is, is, is really uh, sort of defining in terms of our uh, times. So I have, I have three excellent speakers who are going to talk to you today. Um, Andrew Davison from Imperial College, uh, who is going to talk about um, things related to perception uh, and localization. Uh, we've got Sarah Bernardini from uh, Royal Holloway University, um, who's going to talk mostly on motion planning and adaptive motion planning, and Ingmar Posner from the Oxford Robotics Institute, who's going to talk about uh, combining the sensing and planning to, to make things uh, happen. Um, so uh, I want to start off by giving you a bit of a... Um, an idea of where we want to lead this session to the kind of things that we want to discuss. And of course, one of the biggest challenges um, in, in robotics today is that uh, we have to look at robots that is um, applicable in domains that are non-conventional. So in the slide here, you can see um, things where robots have been used traditionally from manufacturing to uh, things like um, uh, asset inspection but also new areas like healthcare, uh, autonomous driving um, in the medical oh. industry. Um, and I think one of the challenges uh, is how do we make the robots of today ready for tomorrow? And um, one area where a lot of researchers have been going is going from traditional way of operating robots, uh, what we call teleoperation, to get robots to be significantly more autonomous. In other words, being able to make decisions on their own. But really the challenge in the next five to 10 years, in the immediate future, is what do we do uh, in, in, the, in the intermediate when significant capabilities of autonomy are still far away? So that's where the concept of shared autonomy comes in. And indeed, uh, full autonomy is extremely hard to achieve because of many challenges. Um, things like we're looking at robots that interact with multiple objects and other robots and humans. We've got ambiguity in our sensing and we need to have guarantees for safe operations. So in those circumstances, there are there are perception, planning and actuation challenges that we need to overcome to achieve uh, this fluid motion between full autonomy and teleoperation. So I want to stop by giving you uh, a single interesting example, um, maybe to set the stage. So if you look at an operation where you have to get a robot to operate remotely in a, a situation where you do not have direct line of sight or you want the robot to operate in another uh, environment, another planet, in another uh, city, then typically what you get is a user control with some punctuated autonomy where a person uh, sees some uh, feedback of what the robot is doing and um, you have to get the robot to operate fairly autonomously making decisions on its own with the user only giving very high level feedback so the challenges to make such a system like this work effectively uh, has at least three components to it so perception for localization and scene understanding adaptive planning for dynamic situations and safe actuation and interaction. And the ability to sift, sort of shift seamlessly between these levels 
is, is key to the success of such an operation. So we luckily have three experts in these areas today to speak to us about their research and some of their vision about how to make these things happen uh, effectively. So what I'm going to do is to invite my first speaker, Andrew Davison from Imperial College, um, to speak about the first topic. And uh, Andrew uh, is, of course, a professor of robotics at Imperial College, but he also has um, a tremendous uh, experience working the intersection of research and industry, working with the Dyson Robotics Lab. So without much ado, uh, over to you, Andrew, for, for your, your exciting 15 minutes. Thank you, Sethi, and th thanks very much for uh, inviting me to take part. Um, so I'm, I'm going to speak to you about, um, so the title of my talk, SLAM to Spatial AI. Uh, so SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. So this is really a important research area in, in robotics and AI more general, and in fact, I think of a fundamental enabling technology uh, in, uh, in, uh, in spatial computing. Um, so just a tiny bit of history to, to start with. So just show you something. This, this was research of mine now from about 15 years ago. Um, and it's a, a, one of the first uh, single camera uh, SLAM systems. So you'll see that what's happening here is we're waving a camera around in a scene. Here we see the view from the camera. It's detecting uh, interesting landmarks in the scene. So these are just natural elements of the scene that we can uh, track. And then if we skip ahead a little here, you'll see what's happening is it's building a 3D map of where those landmarks are in the scene. That is giving it some sort of representation of the shape of the scene. But then what, what that's really useful for here is to track the position of the camera. So if you see this uh, block kind of flying around, that's the estimated position of the camera, which is being updated uh, every uh, 30th of a second here. Um, so we call this in, in SLAM sparse mapping, and it, its main uh, kind of use is to, is to enable positioning of, of devices. And actually, this is a technology that's now out there in a range of, of real products that, that, that are on the market. So these are within several categories, some of which we might think of as uh, robots, such as robot vacuum cleaners or drones, and some of which we might not necessarily think of as robots, but they're, they're spatial computing devices that humans would use, such as uh, smartphones or, or headsets for augmented reality or, or virtual reality. So in these systems, c computer vision is, is used. So there's cameras in these devices alongside other, other sensors. They're building these uh, kind of maps of the scene, and therefore they're able to estimate their positions as they move around through scenes. So. That's re really in enabling, um, but I think it would be fair to say that these are still fairly preliminary products. And what we really want to get to is, is a much more general uh, ability for these spaces, these devices to understand you know, what, what's going on in, in the scenes around them. So just briefly to say a little more about this one. So this is the Dyson 360i that I was personally uh, in involved in working on together with the, the robotics team at Dyson. And this uh, you know, implements a, a single camera SLAM system. So the, the bubble you can see in the top in the middle there is an omnidirectional camera. And this is used to make a map of, of the room that it's in and enable a robust uh, localization. Um, but I think where we really need to go if, if we want these devices to be much more generally capable is, is to add levels of performance to this essential localization capability based on a sparse map if we could add dense mapping and eventually semantic understanding, these devices could really behave intelligently. So I've been using this term spatial AI recently to refer to this whole capability of, of devices that can really have an, enough perception and understanding of the scenes around them to, to perform in a generally uh, intelligent way. So let's just imagine a little bit where that may take us in, in, in a few years. So in, uh, in, in robotics, um, let, let's imagine you know, a quite general purpose home robot. So just to say that this picture here is in no way representative of any sort of product or aid or concept under development at, uh, in, in, in Dyson or, or other way that I know of. Um, but, but, but imagine a general purpose home robot that could really do a wide range of different things, cleaning, tidying, dealing with complicated rooms and objects. Um, that, but, but if that project, if that uh, product were really to e exist, it would, First of all, have to have very general kind of scene understanding and, and uh, 
uh, AI capability, but, but also it will be constrained by a number of factors, including price, aesthetics, size, safety, and, and power usage. Um, so that's uh, you know a, a, an idea for a completely autonomous uh, device. But at the other end of the scale, imagine this this device. So, a, so a, a general purpose um, augmented augmented reality system, which is uh, you know something like a pair of glasses that a, a person might wear, and it would, if working perfectly, provide a robust and accurate real time overlay and spatial memory of all places, objects, and and people uh, that, that you had encountered. But the, the constraints on a product like this are even stronger. So it, we, I think for this to really change the world, it probably has to weigh 65 grams, something like the weight of a normal uh, pair of glasses and have all day battery life. So I would really like to make the point that I think we're still got a very long way to go to, to get to products like this. And I've just got a little uh, visualization here where we've got a kind of cliff here on the left with the current products that already exist. We've got some prototypes kind of out there in research uh, labs that are making some progress across this gap. But then I think we've still got orders of magnitude more progress needed before we get to this full spatial AI, which can really go into real products. And, and the fact that these products don't exist yet is not because there's no demand. It's because no one yet knows how to build them. So I think we can highlight two key areas where existing products and, and algorithms are not yet good enough. I, I would call those robustness, which is this general capability to deal with varied situations and efficiency. So just to show you a couple more clips uh, from, from our research in the lab, highlighting the sort of things that have been going on towards working towards these higher levels of, of capability. So first of all, this is a dense mapping system. So in comparison with the, the video I showed you earlier, which was just mapping a few sparse points in the scene, this is a system that's trying to build a full 3D detailed map of all of the surfaces uh, that it can see in, in the scene. Um, so this is a relatively heavyweight system. We're, we're using uh, you know, a representation with, with millions of sort of points to represent this room and a lot of computation. So this runs on a you know, a big, powerful PC type of system. But as you can see, it's able to give us this really detailed um, map of, of, of a scene. Um, but still, this system is only really um, building geometry. So that the, the more recent um, interest in, in a lot of this area is can we move towards maps of scenes that are dense and detailed, but also have meaning. So not just clouds of points, but also the identity of objects. So this is uh, some, some results from a prototype system we, we built a few years ago called Semantic Fusion, where we combine that kind of dense mapping system with the power of, of, of neural networks, which can be applied to images, and start to estimate the, the type of object that's present at every pixel of every image. And in Semantic Fusion, we fuse all of those per frame estimates into a sort of point cloud that's now colored with estimates of the type of object that are present everywhere. And you can see the results here are somewhat satisfying. So the different colors indicate, you know, whether we think things are chairs or tables, still a bit noisy and, and, and so on. Um, so that kind of br brings me on to this. So, so the performance is still not quite there. You know, there, there are other systems that do, do a bit better than that, but it is hard to do things like this. But the other point I would like to highlight is there, there's a lot of computation needed to do this. So this is just a rough sketch of the of the computation, like system level graph of how a real time system like that actually works. And, it, and it's pretty complicated. There's huge data flows going going around. And in terms of getting down to the efficiency that I think we need for these real embedded products, I, I think we're not close. So there's two key lines of attack which we can take, which we're following in, in our lab and others. One is representation, and the other is to look at novel uh, processing hardware. So just to quickly look at those two things. Uh, so, so in terms of representation, so if we want to build maps of scenes that have both geometry and meaning, I think we can be smarter than just, first of all, building a very detailed geometric map and then somehow kind of painting it with uh, this semantic meaning texture on, on top of that. So here's a system we've worked on recently, which is called uh, Node Slam, which is an example of a slightly different way of going around things. Uh, so here we, we have a camera moving through a scene, and there's an example here of a, of a depth image captured by a camera. Um, but what we're going to do is try and directly now fit object models. 
to this map. So we've done some prior machine learning on a 3D data set of objects. So for instance, we had you know, 100 CAD models of mugs, and we've learned a kind of shape space that represents all the possible shapes of mugs. And now we have some real data coming in. Let me just skip forward to a slightly uh, the video. So here and now we've got a camera moving around the table on which there's a variety of, of, of objects. And each time we detect one of these objects, we're going to fit and optimize one of these shape models to represent it. And what we end up with is, is this sort of token based map of the objects in the scene, which is something a bit similar to the sort of sparse point map I showed you at the start. But now each of the points is now an object which has a position, a 3D shape uh, and, and, and an orientation. So this is now a very efficient and useful representation of, of the scene. And I'll show you briefly what, what that could be useful for. So we've actually used this now in a robotic system. So here we've got a, a camera on a robot arm which moves around, it takes a few views of the scene, it fits these uh, object models, and now it's got you know, a kind of full, both geometric and semantic understanding of the scene, which allows it to plan very intelligent action. So what we're doing here is now picking up, first of all, the bowls in order of size. So it will pick up the largest one first, and it's picked it up in a very precise way, such that it's able to now also place it precisely. So it's gonna build a stack of bowls in this box in, in order of size. So, you, the, so you'll see that they stack properly. And then it will go and pick up the, the mugs uh, and also place those nice and precisely so it can't stack these particular mugs because of the handles, but it's able to place them uh, pre precisely. So you'll see that this representation of the scene that, that's both uh, you know semantically meaningful but also very efficient allows this very intelligent uh, action. Um, so just to briefly come back to, to this uh, slide here and, and say that the other angle of, of attack that we think is really useful in, in terms of how we're going to optimize the performance of this graph is thinking about new computing hardware. And actually, there, there's a kind of revolution underway in, in processor hardware. So we've largely been using for, for AI processors that were designed for other things, so both CPUs that are generally you know very general purpose pro processors, they're great for you know, running word processors or something, but they're not necessarily very optimal for, for AI. We've been using GPUs a lot, graphics processing units. They were really designed for graphics. They're, they're quite good for certain things in, in AI, such as running CNNs, but they're also not necessarily optimal. And if we think of a, a system like Semantic Fusion, we use bits of CPU, bits of GPU, and a lot of data flowing in between. There are new, new concepts out there, um, and in particular, there's uh, th this concept of a graph processor. So this is a di uh, there's there's a, a great example designed by a company called GraphCore in in Bristol. They call it the IPU, an intelligent processing unit. So it, it's a massively uh, parallel chip, similar to to a, a GPU in th in that sense. But the way that it is designed is quite different in that each of the individual cores on that chip does not need to be doing the same thing in the same way that the GPU does. So each core can be doing quite different things and they can, and it's very efficient at passing messages between them. So it's able to implement quite general graph-based processing. So something I've been thinking about a lot recently is what are the graphs that happen in the processing of, of SLAM and spatial AI type systems. And concretely, we, we've just published uh, something recently on how we can come up with different ways of, of doing classical uh, sort of estimation that's involved in SLAM and spatial AI, but, but using algorithms that are much more based on message passing and are therefore able to be mapped very efficiently to these new types of processes such as uh, GraphCore's IPU. Okay, so I'm just going to conclude there. So I think working on this area of spatial AI research is, is uh, you know, very interesting. I think we're going to be doing it for a long time yet. I th think this idea of building representations of scenes that are both uh, geometric and semantic is crucial, whether you've got fully autonomous devices or devices that really work with, with humans in the loop. Some particular research interests, uh, I think, are, are really important. So co-design of processes, sensors and algorithms, and graph-based algorithms for estimation. And just to quickly mention my, my affiliations, so I'm, I'm director of the Dyson Robotics Lab at Imperial College, which is an academic lab uh, funded by and, and collaborating with, with Dyson on SLAM, scene understanding and manipulation. 
Uh, I'm also co-founder of a, uh, of a startup company in London called Slamcore, which, which develops applied spatial AI solutions. So thank you. The technology worked well and all of you around the world are able to, to watch and listen to this exciting uh, set of talks. So uh, next, um, we have Sarah Bernardini from the Royal Holloway University. So Sarah is a professor uh, of artificial intelligence there, but she also has an extensive experience working uh, with NASA Ames. Um, and so she's going to talk about uh, shared autonomy and uh, planning under those settings. So over to you, Sarah. So thank you for uh, the invitation to talk in this uh, workshop. So this is a short journey from interpretable behavior to uh, joint uh, deliberation. Uh, so autonomy refers uh, to the robot's ability to organize its behavior to accomplish high-level goals. Share autonomy is when um, uh, we have uh, agents that are autonomous, but at the same time, they, they share the agency with humans. And, um, and this is a, a very interesting space and there are three uh, dimensions that I need to uh, we, we need to look at. Uh, the first is uh, the role of the human uh, in, in with respect to the robot, whether they are partners or uh, one is the observer and the other uh, is the agent that is acting. Uh, the second dimension is whether or not uh, they share uh, the same physical space or they are in two different spaces. And the third dimension is a spatial, uh, sorry, it's a temporal dimension. And so uh, this has to do uh, with whether uh, they um, can uh, communicate uh, effectively um, in time. So uh, I uh, want to explore uh, these uh, three uh, dimensions uh, more uh, with respect to uh, extreme environments. That um, is really the core of, of my research. So these are um, environments that present uh, extreme uh, conditions that make it difficult for humans to inhabit or work uh, in these spaces. So you can think uh, of, for example, operations in uh, nuclear plants uh, or underwater, in space, um, mining, oil and gas, and all these uh, uh, difficult environments. So in this case, uh, clearly, uh, if we look at the spatial dimension, the human and the robot uh, don't share uh, the same physical space. And this is the whole point of robotics for extreme environments, uh, that we can send robots uh, in this um, environments that are very dangerous instead of uh, sending uh, humans. And uh, so um, usually um, if we look at the agency dimension, we have that uh, the robot is the actor because uh, the robot is situated in the extreme environments and uh, the human uh, is the observer. So it um, is supervising uh, the mission uh, at a distance. And then uh, in some environments, like for example, uh, space uh, or underwater operations, uh, there might be significant um, uh, communication delays between uh, the robot and the human operator, uh, which exclude, uh, for example, teleoperation or a close supervision uh, of the robot from uh, the part of the operator. Uh, so, um, and just to give you an idea uh, of uh, the latest development uh, in uh, robotics for extreme environments in the UK, I will uh, quickly present uh, three projects uh, I am involved uh, in. Uh, these are uh, collaborations between uh, academia and industry, and they are also partly founded by Innovate UK, which is uh, the innovation uh, agency in the UK. So uh, the first uh, is uh, um, MIMRI. Uh, this is the world's first fully autonomous multi-robot platform for inspection, maintenance, and repair of offshore wind farms. So as you can see here, uh, we have an autonomous boat on board of which we have a team of robots. So we have drones that can inspect uh, the blades of the turbine. And also, um, if uh, the, the blade needs repairing, uh, we can uh, deploy a climbing robot uh, that has a manipulator uh, that can perform some repairing uh, tasks. Uh, the second project um, 
is uh, Connect R, and this is a self-building and modular robot um, that uh, provides structure in unstructured hazardous environment. So if you think about, uh, for example, nuclear decommissioning or disaster response, uh, we have the situation in which uh, um, often for robots is difficult to traverse these spaces because there might be mud, water, or other problems on the surface. So here the idea is to develop a structure, a stable structure for a robot uh, to traverse. So you can see here uh, that uh, we have this self-building robot can, that can configure itself in any uh, shape uh, we want. And this is done completely autonomously uh, without any intervention from any human operator. And in this case, it's going to create this uh, cube, but, but it can uh, configure itself in any, uh, in any structure. And then um, the uh, last project um, I'm working on currently uh, is uh, Prometheus. So in this case, uh, we have um, a reconfigurable uh, drone uh, that uh, um, is exploring um, uh, some uh, underground mines. So these are difficult spaces because these are extremely confined spaces, so very dangerous to send a uh, human operator uh, in them. There might be gases, uh, mud, water, so it's very difficult to explore uh, these uh, spaces. And so we are uh, developing this new drone uh, that uh, is trying to map uh, the whole environment and come up uh, with a uh, um, volumetric uh, map uh, of it. So um, each extreme environment has its own uh, specificities, but at the same time, they also present some common uh, challenges. So first of all, uh, in this environment, uh, we need um, a higher um, level of autonomy. And this is because, uh, as I said, uh, these uh, robots uh, are alone uh, in, in these extreme environments, so there is no human inside that could help them if something goes wrong. Uh, also, uh, clearly, uh, robustness of operations is crucial because these are high-stakes environment in which any uh, mistakes could be uh, lethal. Um, in addition, these uh, robots need to exhibit um, some flexibility of behavior because uh, uh, these are environments that are often completely unknown before starting exploring them. They are characterized by a high level of uncertainty. And so the robot needs to show some creativity in handling uh, new uh, situations. And finally, uh, as I said, uh, though uh, the, the human, uh, the robot is alone uh, in, the, um, in the extreme environment, we have a human operator, a team of operators that uh, supervise the mission uh, at a distance. And so clearly we need to build a, a trustworthy partnership between uh, the robots and the humans. And the humans need to be able to trust um, uh, the operations of the robots. So uh, to tackle uh, these uh, challenges, um, uh, we uh, integrate uh, into the perceptual and uh, mobile layers of the robot a, a deliberation uh, layer. Uh, so uh, this deliberation uh, layer is in charge of uh, formulating a long-term uh, course of action uh, for the robot to achieve the high-level uh, goals of the mission. Imagine that usually these robots need to perform complex, sophisticated tasks that require some um, strategic uh, thinking, and they have limited resources, so they have to consider all these things at the same time. So a planner um, is... Um, um, a, a tool uh, that selects and organizes actions to bring about a desired uh, goal. And planners use uh, temporal and causal models uh, to predict how uh, the actor's uh, actions um, can affect the environment. And we will see later how we can leverage uh, these uh, models uh, to um, uh, empower share autonomy. And uh, in my project, I use um, planning at different levels. Uh, so we have mission planning, task planning, and motion planning. And also we use a variety of techniques from symbolic planners to reinforcement learning um, and uh, other similar techniques. So, um, 
uh, to go back to this point uh, that in these missions we have uh, the robot uh, that is acting into the um, um, into the extreme environments but also uh, we have uh, a human operator uh, that uh, is supervising the mission at a distance and clearly this operator uh, is ultimately in charge of the success of the mission and so uh, this operator needs to really understand uh, the plan um, and uh, um, uh, share uh, this uh, this plan with the robot. Uh, now, um, so the, the robot uh, plan needs to be interpretable uh, to the human uh, in the loop. Uh, so imagine that this is quite a switch because for a long time uh, planning has focused uh, purely on uh, creating effective plans for the robots uh, without really worrying about uh, any human uh, in the loop. Uh, now, uh, this um, creation of, of, of plans uh, that are interpretable uh, is not um, such an easy task. And this is because we have two models of the world at play at this point, the model of the world of the robot and the model of the world of the human operator. And these models include the state information, goals, beliefs, intentions, capabilities, reward functions. Now, if these two models don't align, clearly the observer will struggle in understanding and interpreting um, the actual um, behavior. Uh, so, um, to, uh, to um, allow for a smooth uh, interaction uh, between the robot and the human operator, uh, the actor, um, the robot uh, that plans, must not only consider its own model of the world, but also uh, the model of the world of the observer, which is the human operator. So um, let's uh, see how we can do that uh, in cooperative settings. Uh, so in this case, our planner will plan not only uh, to uh, reach um, uh, efficiently the high level goals of the missions but also to maximize other um, other metrics for example it could maximize a plan uh, legibility uh, which uh, reduces the ambiguity over the possible goals that the actor might want to achieve so if you look at this uh, first uh, picture uh, here um, and say that um, the robot wants to reach uh, the cell at the top right, um, uh, but the human operator is uncertain about which uh, top cell uh, the robot wants to achieve. Now, uh, clearly, um, the robot can uh, take either the red um, plan to achieve the uh, top right cell or uh, the green plan. And they are exactly the same from the point of view of the robot of the cost uh, that he has to suffer to reach this position. However, uh, clearly, if it takes the, the green plan, um, it will disambiguate um, its goal much um, quicker than if it takes uh, the red plan. So from a legibility point of view, the, the green plan needs to be preferred. And so the robot will take that plan to make um, very clear which uh, goal is trying to achieve. We have also plan uh, predictability that reduces the ambiguity over possible uh, plans and plan explicability, uh, which has to do with how close a plan is to the expectations of the observer. Now uh, let's um, switch to an adversarial setting. So imagine that you are in a counter uh, surveillance mission uh, in which you need to plan for a vehicle uh, that has to accompany a vulnerable person um, to a secret location um, that um, an attacker wants to disclose. Now at this point, actually the goal uh, of the, the vehicle uh, is uh, to um, obfuscate uh, the, uh, its real uh, goal, not to make it legible. Um, and so goal obfuscation increases the ambiguity over possible goals that uh, the actor might want to achieve. So in this particular case, uh, if there, there are these four uh, destinations possible, um, well, the vehicle could uh, take um, naively the shortest path to these destinations, but uh, it will disclose uh, its um, uh, goal pretty uh, quickly. Uh, however, it can decide also to uh, actually um, suffer a higher cost, uh, so don't uh, go for the shortest path, but choose a longer path, uh, but maintain its uh, goal more obfuscated. So, uh, yeah, in this Sarah, case, sorry, can I yeah. briefly interrupt you? So yeah. we are uh, running horribly short of time, uh, so we need to get you to conclude in a minute or so. All right. Uh, yeah. 
Sure. So, um, so then um, the next stage uh, it would be uh, joint uh, deliberation. So, so far we have seen uh, just a, a passive observer, but we can have actually an active observer. Uh, so. Um, an observer um, that can uh, participate in the plan creation with uh, the robot. And so what we do, we combine AI planning and computational argumentation uh, in such a way that in a dialogical way, uh, the robot and the human operator uh, can um, uh, move arguments uh, to decide which actions to perform and uh, they start with different models of the world but through this argumentation process that they, they can reconcile uh, their models and they also can engage in counterfactual reasoning by leveraging uh, the causal uh, model that is uh, behind uh, planning and this is was just uh, to show a few open problems I'm, I'm working on currently uh, that I think are very important problems in AI so how can the robot learn uh, the human's model of the world. So this has to do with preference uh, inference and corrigibility. And then we have value alignment between the robot and the human. And finally, acceptability of uh, autonomous robots in extreme environments. Because it might seem to, um, that it's uncontroversial to use uh, autonomous robots in extreme environments, but still uh, there is a fear of robots replacing humans. And so we need to work with the human operators um, and make sure that we empower them by the use of robots and we don't feel they don't feel threatened uh, by them thank you very much excellent thank you thank you sarah very much um and uh, i think uh, if, if there's a bit of a squeeze for time so we'll try and get back to um, interesting questions uh, for all of the speakers in the q a session that happens immediately so um so, so can i uh, then uh, pass uh, the stage to ingmar posner so Ingmar is a professor uh, of robotics at the Oxford Robotics Institute. Uh, he's a co-founder of Oxbotica, the autonomous driving car, and he's been doing some exciting work at the intersection of motion planning, actuation, and and, and really deploying some of the uh, some of his work on uh, real-world uh, uh, sort of domains. So, uh, without much ado, over to you, Ingmar, um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, take it take it away. Thank you, Sethu. Um, firstly, can you see my slides and can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see your slides. Uh, now is better. Yes, I you can, can see your see slides. slides. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, last time I did this was in a very, very cold, rainy tent um, at, at Covex a year or two ago. So uh, this is this is an improvement. Um, I would like to pick up on a few things that previous speakers said, uh, but I would like to take a slightly different view of this because shared autonomy um, typically has a, a bad rep, right? It has a bad reputation because it implies a limitation and that something went wrong. And so equally, human-machine collaboration often has a connotation of tediousness and voice assistants, of course, are awesome because um, they enable a natural mode of interaction until we ask for uh, something other than to play a song for the weather, right? And um, taking that further, has anyone here ever really tried to assemble, for example, IKEA furniture uh, together with a with a robot arm? I think you can get a sense of, of where I'm headed with this. Now, what I would like to talk about here very much is sort of the upsides, like the positive aspects of shared autonomy and human-robot uh, collaboration, uh, which is really about upskilling our robots by essentially learning from us. And that is something that is really at scale in meaningful tasks only been uh, able to happen uh, very, very recently. And the way we do this, of course, is via machine learning, right? Uh, we've, we've touched it in the past, uh, in the previous uh, couple of talks, uh, a bunch of terms were mentioned. But ultimately, what I would like to take away from, from this is that machine learning is sort of an associated process, right? It maps some form of input to some form of output via some model um, that is learned, and that might be a, a model that expresses is like or is of class and so on. And of course, we've been able to do this for decades, right? So um, cats and dogs have been particularly uh, successful, clearly. Um, so what's changed? What's changed recently? And many of you will have heard about uh, the deep learning revolution, right? And I'm not going to go into anything uh, in detail here other than for the purposes of this narrative, what deep learning has brought us, which is that we can now uh, accurately learn some very, very complex mappings. And then once they're learned, execute these mappings very, very quickly indeed. And that is a complete and utter game changer. When I talk about mappings, um, what do I mean? Well, a lot of you will already have uh, heard of, for example, gameplay, right? So if you wanted to play tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses, you'd start with an empty 
with an empty field, um, you uh, would make a turn that's one of nine, then your opponent would make a turn that's you know at that point one of eight, and so on and so on until the game is over. And one particular pass through this tree, this game tree, would be one of those games, right? Now, in tic-tac-toe, there are about 250,000 legal ways to play this particular game. And on average, on average, there are four legal moves per turn. And in order to work out a good strategy uh, to play tic-tac-toe, for example, uh, how useful is my current position? Um, and um, what move should I make next? You need to work through approximately four to the power k sequences of moves. If you were to ask yourselves what a good machine learning strategy would be to play tic-tac-toe, then uh, a good answer to that might be a lookup table, right? Because you can store this sort of stuff in memory. It becomes much harder, of course, when we talk about chess, where uh, it's the, the four to the k sort of equivalent actually is 10 to the 124 sequences of moves, right? Um, and for reference, there are 10 to the 80, 10 to the 80 um, atoms in the visible universe, right? So we're getting we're getting uh, pretty pretty ridiculously large, and the reason why Go uh, and AlphaGo was such an enormous breakthrough is because in that particular context we're talking to talking about um, ten to the three hundred and sixty, right? And that is why AlphaGo um, and AlphaGo Zero and the entire family of AlphaGo algorithms has been uh, so exciting, um, and that's that's something that, that that we thank our colleagues at, at DeepMind for, of course. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that was really learned through self-play by lever leveraging an algorithm called Monte Carlo Tree Search together with some other machinery um, that allowed machines to basically learn by themselves from zero, right? And I'll talk about why that is important in a second. But ultimately, what we've done here is sort of distill knowledge from these algorithms um, into a machine learning model that you see in the middle here, um, where you uh, take an input and you map that to where should I go next, right? Another way of doing this, uh, or when we take that further out of the games uh, sort of realm, is uh, physical intuition. So when you and I look at a, a picture like this, uh, we kind of have a hunch as to whether it may, uh, the block tower may fall over or not, right? Uh, what we don't do is take the picture, analyze, write down the laws of physics, analyze it in a physical simulator, and play it forward. Instead, we sort of have a hunch. Computers, of course, can absolutely run simulators that ultimately allow us to uh, simulate that sort of thing forward, which means, once again, they can sort of self-supervise. Machines can, again, learn from machines in terms of how the world evolves, right? And again, we can take that knowledge and we can distill that into a um, into a machine learning model, that one here, uh, that takes an input and makes a particular prediction as to whether it's stable or maybe even what the individual parts of the, of the tower are, and so on and so on. Now, why do we actually care about this? Where does that go? Well, um, these mappings become increasingly complex. And so far, I've talked about machines teaching machines, which is a super exciting area of research in and of itself because it allows machines to acquire new skills sort of by themselves, often through trial and error. There are different ways of doing it. But if we now look at that in the context of human-machine collaboration, and particularly shared collaboration, there exists enormous opportunity in having machines actually learn from humans and how they act. Um, and that is where, where uh, things become really quite exciting, where there's a lot of opportunities for col uh, in collaboration and sort of upskilling of robots. What might that look like? So imagine, for example, uh, that you have a system like this, where at the top you see uh, a, a camera image that you might see uh, uh, as you look out the, the front screen of a, of a car. And at the bottom, you see something that um, Andy has already alluded to, which is a three-way segmentation, where red basically means obstacle, don't go there. Blue means, well, it could be traversable, but uh, you know I don't really care. And green is not what some people think a lane detection, but green is basically saying where in this particular circumstance would the human drive, OK? Um, and that is sort of very interesting, because as you see here, uh, it allows us to sort of cross white lines, things that are very, very difficult to encode in sort of rules, because rules tend to get ever so slightly broken to make the world work, right? But how we came, came up with this is conceptually very, very similar, right? So in this particular case, a human drives the car, and we have lots and lots of systems engineering that's gone into building the car. So we know where, for example, the wheels of the car touch the ground. So those are the, the, the green dots here. Clearly, anything between the dots is the car itself. During training, there is a, an obstacle detector. Think of it like a, a laser scanner, for example, that uh, looks at where things are. And we're saying everything there and above that is obstacle, so don't go there. And anything that isn't green or red is blue. We don't really care. It's probably not obstacle, but we don't really want to particularly go there. And what that means is that every time uh, a human gets in and drives the car in this particular system, through the system engineering, uh, we're able to generate a whole bunch of training data that we can then use to learn, for example, uh, semantic uh, uh, segmentation models. So in this case, a deep network um, that then is able from a single mono image to produce a segmentation like that. 
So again, we have this notion of some input, which is the street scene via some machine learning model that says looks like into a segmentation um, that says, uh, you know, tend to be here, don't go here. And um, that is sort of interesting because uh, this is now a direct way of providing human supervision, um, learning from what humans do into a machine learning model that then can be applied in the real world. Um, now, how these systems get applied is, of course, super interesting. Uh, some people might say, well, given that we've got these images, we might want to hook those up to a, you know, to a steering wheel and an accelerator and press go. Um, I am of a different opinion. Many other people are also <laughs> of a different opinion, but there are ways to leverage these systems successfully in autonomous systems. Where you might want to consider hooking these other things up directly to actuation, however, is in the context of um, manipulation, right? So um, there is a whole bunch of work out there on a thing called visual motor control, um, where basically uh, you're saying you have some form of input, uh, which is the view of the robot in a particular input uh, scenario. Um, you then uh, have a learner that basically has knowledge of what should be done in order to achieve a certain task. And in this particular case, the task might be put the red cube onto the blue plate. And uh, as you then go forward, um, that then that learner produces motion commands that directly command the arm in such a way that it sequ uh, sequentially puts the uh, puts the red cube onto the blue plate. And um, that is, again, supervised uh, by demonstration. In this particular case, though, it is supervised by a machine already doing it. And this might be a very complex uh, setup. It might be a very expensive controller to run, for example, um, if you wanted to make this, this complex. But the idea, again, is that you then take that knowledge, you distill it into the learner, uh, and you map directly from input to, in this case, motion commands. Um, and ideally, of course, we would like to be able to do this from human demonstration. And I'm going to talk in a second about why that is problematic. If you get that right, however, you end up with something that uh, you might be able to reuse in different contexts. Like, for example, this now here at the top might be a target image. You want the red cube to be on the blue plate. Your controller executes it. But you might be able to condition it in a different sort of way, right? So your target might now be have the, to use the same skill to have the blue cube, uh, sorry, the yellow cube on the, on the green plate um, and execute this, right? And you can take that to sort of any, any extreme, right, in that sense. Um, and so being able to distill knowledge from human demonstrations, ideally, even though here these demonstrations were not from humans, but being able to do that promises the, um, the acquisition of sort of versatile skills, which is exactly what we want in a collaborator. You'd like to show this, um, your collaborator a couple of things or maybe refine what they're doing a couple of times and then be able to, um, uh, to more successfully collaborate with, uh, with them in the future because a new skill has been acquired. So shared autonomy really is a, is a huge opportunity. Um, I hope I'm kind of making the case here that uh, our robots are now able to learn from us with a capacity and at a scale that is, that is really unheard of until recent times, because we could do many of these things in sort of small um, uh, domains uh, previously, but this has now really been a game changer. Um, machines can also now acquire sort of very complex skills from exploration, trial and error. This is typically what uh, reinforcement learning does. Uh, as well as demonstration and collaboration. Um, and this means that interventions, which often we call as, or we, we, we associate with something having gone wrong, which is kind of true, um, uh, that these sort of interventions pose actually uh, significant opportunities, right? And here we might consider, as I said, acquiring new skills or refining existing ones, um, learning models of behavior. And that really goes back to uh, some of the work that, that Sarah talked about, where, for example, um, you might uh, uh, learn a model of where people operate, uh, where they move in an environment, um, or um, uh, how they tend to interact with, with things or what they tend to do at a particular time in order to, in order, uh, in order to help them or augment their, their, their actions in order to replicate or predict or somehow optimize user engagement, right? So, so the space of opportunities is truly large. However, and there was bound to be a however, um, challenges are, as I say here, plentiful, right? So some of the open questions um, are pretty, pretty foundational, right? So deep learning in particular has a data problem. Um, we need our, our machines to acquire skills efficiently. And often when I talk about learning from demonstration, I literally talk about thousands or tens of thousands um, of demonstrations that are required to actually uh, learn these particular skills. Now, imagine that in the context of a uh, collaborator, you want to show that that person or that machine or that robot or that entity once or twice. You don't want to have to show them 
you know, many thousands of times. Of course, there are opportunities in doing this um, in the context of crowdsourcing, and that again is a, is a different space of opportunity. Another interesting point here is how do we best interact? So uh, human-robot interaction and sort of effective computing are excellent um, in the sense of uh, predicting what people might like to do and how they tend to interact and shaping those interactions, predicting mood and, and feeling and attitude and so on. But there's a lot of work still required in sensing uh, uh, and also in the perception and the interpretation of these effective signals in order to actually derive a learning signal. It's, it's not enough to say, hey, we're going here. It's saying, well, if somebody touches something or if something, somebody pushes the plank that we're both holding or the table that we're both trying to transport from A to B in a particular way that has a meaning. We communicate via these sort of signals, both intent as well as sort of state of mind, frustration or or satisfaction or otherwise. And we are still some way away of being able to do that uh, reliably, not just on the interpretation level, but on the um, sensing level. So touch and tactile, tactile uh, sensing are, 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 big, um, uh, are big sort of ongoing research areas in that direction. Um, when is learning required uh, is also a, a very, very important point, And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, um, which is really about machines knowing when they don't know. Uh, and uh, it turns out that in machine learning, we've, we've struggled with this for, uh, for a long while, and we continue to struggle for, uh, with this. Going back to something that Sethu said earlier uh, about this notion of you know, this, this pipeline uh, of perception, planning, and action um, that typically people employ, the case that I'm making here is really that we increasingly break this down, right? Uh, because um, one way of looking at this, uh, at what's happened in the past, is that um, we have these systems that on one hand, on the on the left here, uh, have uh, uh, knowledge distilled in these learning models, which then uh, quickly execute some fairly sophisticated um, uh, mappings, which come from, from typically resource intensive oracles. And these oracles could be over here, the things on the on the right. So for example, direct human supervision, so training labels, um, algorithms that are expensive in some way that sort of uh, play games by themselves for self-learning. Hundreds of person hours uh, of uh, of systems engineering, um, you know, physical knowledge, uh, and so on and so on. The list, the list goes on. And that's. Sort of the, uh, uh, I have to step in here, unfortunately, again. To uh, we are horribly yeah. out of time for our next Q and A session. Um, so, if that's okay, uh, I think uh, message heard loud and clear. I think okay. there's a very interesting opportunity to marry human capabilities with a robot. Um, you know, uh, through learning schemes. Uh, also, how do we kind of marry the best of, uh, how do you get the best of both worlds? So carry, uh, marry sort of human ingenuity and bias into the problem and use machine learning techniques to to push the next, uh, you know, level, to push it to the next level. Yeah, which would so, have literally been this very last slide. So I'm basically done. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, perfect! Uh, thank you, Ingmar, and and thank you to all of our uh, our um, uh, our speakers so far. Uh, in terms of uh, you know getting out, getting all the interesting ideas out there, and I hope uh, all of you listeners who've been out there uh, have got some interesting questions for our speakers. So we're going to come back in less than five minutes, um, and I think all of you will have a link to where to go to for your, the Q&A session. And uh, we are looking forward to an interesting set of questions, debates, answers from, from these speakers. So I will pass this back to, to, to Will um, to, to conclude the session. Thank you, Setu, and a big thank you to all of our speakers for a really great opening set of presentations. As Setu has said, for those of you with the correct kind of pass, we will be back very shortly for a Q&A session at 11 o'clock. So go stretch your legs, but don't go too far. Thank you and hope to see many of you soon. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.